Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Young. I'm a member of the Committee 100, and I'm chair of the Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings Program. And I welcome uh, all of you to this event, which I'm very excited about and uh, very pleased to have Professor uh, Chin as our, uh, as our guest speaker today. Before I introduce her, uh, I just want to briefly summarize uh, for you the, uh, uh, you know, what this program is all about and why the Committee 100 has focused uh, a lot of its energy on this program. So uh, this program started in uh, February of 2020, uh, and that was because it fit in very nicely into one of the twin missions of the Committee 100, and that, that, that mission being uh, finding ways to help people uh, who, uh, Asian American and Chinese Americans be fully included in society uh, in all respects, whether it's to block discrimination or to, to help with advancement and so forth. So obviously uh, the career ceiling issue is directly in the middle of this, of this uh, mission. And so we're very pleased to have had some wonderful speakers and researchers and millennials and industry leaders talk about the issue from their point of view. Um, this, uh, uh, this program, this is the 29th event that we've had. The 30th will be on September 20th, which is Asian American Career Ceilings, Voting and Representation. We have a wonderful panel uh, of, of leading people in this space because actually voting and representation is really closely tied in with the career ceiling issue. And I think uh, if you don't have voting and representation, then a lot of the things that, uh, that, that, that can be done to lower the amount of career ceiling problems uh, just won't happen. So I hope all of you uh, uh, who are interested will attend. It's September 20th uh, at four o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, and we'll be very, very happy to have you there. The um, uh, so with that, I, I'm very pleased to uh, to introduce uh, Professor Marker Chin. First of all, I want to congratulate her on becoming the chair of the sociology department at Hunter College. Uh, my father was a professor and my mother was a professor, and they said um, there's nothing more exciting than trying to manage tenured professors and telling them what to do, right? And it, there's nothing more difficult because number one, you can't fire them. And number two is they care about money, but not that much. And so getting them to do what you want them to do is not easy. So congratulations, I guess, Professor Chin, right? <laughs> right. You got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but the topic is really the work that she, today is the work that she's done and also the book that hopefully uh, a number of you uh, have, um, you know, have purchased and read, which is the book called Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. Uh, I've read the book. I really enjoyed it. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful read and had a lot of really interesting and powerful insights as to what the problem is and, and, and why, and an interesting approach towards trying to get that understanding. So let's start out, and Professor Chen, maybe if you could explain to the audience sort of your background, you know, uh, your career, uh, but then also, you know, why you decided to take an interest in this particular topic, because you actually do write on different types of issues, uh, not just this issue. So it'd be interesting to hear why you decided uh, to, 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 to focus on this and do a fair amount of work. Thank you. For, well, first, I'd like to thank Peter and the Committee of 100 and this whole panel series that you're having. And I think they're really important for people to listen and to talk about Asian Americans and the difficulty in moving up in the um, in the career ladders. I think it's a it's a topic that uh, wasn't talked about all that often before you started and before actually the book came out, too. Um, I know Jane Han wrote a book, um, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, but that was back in I think 2005, um, and not a whole lot, and not a whole lot of thought went into this this topic um, since then. I mean, corporations talk about it, but not anybody really thinking about um, how we do and how we move up. 
So let me get back to who I am and then I'll go back to the topic. So I was born in New York City. I grew up in New York City. I was a child of um, immigrant working class parents. My father was a waiter. My mother was a garment worker. So I went to New York City public schools, including Stuyvesant High School. And then I went into went off to Harvard. And of course, my parents wanted me to work in, you know, in the corporate ladder to have um, a secure income. So I actually worked at IBM for like six years. So I was actually in the corporate world for six years. I had a pretty supportive um, manager when I worked there in Boston. And then when I came to New York, not quite so much so, um, but the Boston um, branch manager was really supportive uh, to women overall. Um, so that was my little experience there. And then also my experience in, in dealing with um, the pipeline and in dealing with and watching people actually um, hit the, um, the glass ceiling or the bamboo ceiling. So how I got to this book, um, oh, I went into academia mostly because I realized that not a whole lot of people were studying Asian Americans. And, um, and when I first went into academia, I realized that very few people wrote about the working class Asian Americans, especially people like my mom in the garment industry in New York City. So that was my first book, my dissertation called Sewing Women. And then I came to this book because you know, I was a Harvard graduate. I um, interviewed um, for applicants, uh, high school applicants applying to college. And one year, I believe it was um, 2013. So it was a class of 2017. Um, I was at a reception at the Harvard Club, New York City. And one of the admissions officers basically asked, so, hey, you're a class of 1984. We've admitted so many Asian Americans since then. So background, my class, there were only 5% Asian Americans. Now they're up to 27% and when 29% and the year that uh, I was at this reception, they accepted 27% of the class Asian Americans. So in that room, there were tons of Asian Americans. And then he basically asked me, so how are Asian Americans doing, you know, moving on up in the corporate sector or in politics or in everything? And I basically looked at him and I said, hmm, you know, I know a lot of friends, but I actually don't know a whole lot of people who are up there, um, you know, especially among my classes, my early classes. I mean, there are some, not to say that there aren't any, but you would think there would be a lot more since we're always seen as, you know, the model minority. And that's what got me thinking about the topic. And that's what got me thinking about researching uh, for this book. And so that's how I got there <laughs> for this topic. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. Uh... Uh, uh, two things I particularly like about the book. One was you did a very good job in the introductory part of really trying to explain what the other, you know, what research has shown and what the data and so forth, which is very helpful, right? Because, you know, people who just have an opinion but don't, you know, at least share some of the data, it's kind of just an opinion, right? As opposed to real data. But you lay that out. But also, I think what was interesting, though, is um, the approach you took where you interviewed people at in different generations. I thought that was a very interesting thing. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because someone in the 80s, going in the 80s or the 90s or the 70s, you know, might have a very different experience. And you have to take that into account. So what led you to do that? And it must have been kind of interesting, right, to, to have these different things and then try to see whether there was some pattern in terms of differences, uh, you know, in experiences and opinions based on, you know, generation. Yeah, part of why I did it that way was that, you know, I'm the generation of the 80s. And then I watched all these younger people, the people that I interviewed to get into Harvard, they actually felt a little differently. I, I learned that in interviewing them even as high schoolers. And I also know as an academic, that you know, it was during the 90s when we saw a huge flood of Asian American, the children of the immigrants actually go to college. So I realized that taking in the 19 graduates of the 1980s, the 1990s and the 2000s meant that there were different, um, I guess, cultural circumstances, different political circumstances, um, all kinds of 
differences among the groups that are actually important to the way they think about themselves. And it's also important that the way the corporations look at these um, different generations of Asian Americans. But however, you know, even though I saw that, um, I also know walking around with, you know, people who, my students, in fact, you know, in, uh, I go, I teach at Hunter College, so around Park Avenue, or around Lexington Avenue, when we're walking outside to get a cup of coffee or something, people all see us as the same generation. So, but I know that they're, you know, 30, 40 years younger than me, you know, so there's a huge difference, but people outside see us actually as still all the same. And those same stereotypes still exist for us. The other reason why I took into account the different generations was that I realized that my generation was the first generation where there were American born, a sizable number of American born. And like you, Peter, you know, we, we speak English without an accent. We, are grow, we grew up knowing all of the American cultural references, you know, and so does the 1.5 generation. And the 1.5 generation are those people who are born in Asia, but are basically raised here. So I counted also all the people who came here before the age of 13. And from, I guess, to the late 1980s and 1990s and the 2000s, we have a ton of people who are like that. So our census shows them as born, born, foreigners. But in fact, half of the people from age 25 to 64 are actually this 1.5 generation. So when you look out into the world, we're actually pretty much half or maybe even a little bit more American born or American raised. So we're pretty much Americans, but the world, when you look at just the census, when you look at what we look like and when people see us, many of us, many of them actually still see us as foreigners. So yeah. that's the reason why I took that tax so that I can get a huge number of people who fit that criteria of 1.5 and those who were born in the USA. Yeah, no, I think it's very interesting. And in fact, the generational issue, I mean, you use, it, it's, it's very important. I'll, I'll give an example. You cited that when you went to Harvard, you know, that it was, you know, X percent, but then it, by now it's like 29% Asian. Um, I'm a little bit older than you. And I went to Yale and there were only 15 Asian Americans in total, including foreign born or not, you know, in a class of, uh, you know, 1100. And, and so it was really, and then, uh, but, and the experience obviously is quite different as we went by. And so there was like a, there's a generational difference. Although, by the way, my son ended up going to the same school. And by the time he was there, uh, it was like 20% or something like that. And I made the mistake of saying, when he went off to college, I said, your mom and I want to know whether you'd like to, us to buy you a rice cooker. And he looked at me and said, dad, <laughs> you know, they serve rice, you know, in the dining room, you know, every meal. Right. So no, don't, don't buy me a rice cooker. But it, the experience is quite different. Like mine would have been different from yours and different from my son. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, uh, uh, phenomenon. Now, one of the things you did, though, is you tried to lay out what people perceived as the reason for the handicap, right, that they were facing. And it also varied. You also tried to explain it through stories about people of different generations and so forth. What would you what would you say would be the probably the biggest issues that people raised? And were they different by the generation? Yeah, so this was the most interesting part. So even though the generations had different access to affirmative action programs or different access to pipeline programs, or even felt whether they were more welcome or not on the campus, right? Because of the numbers on campus, they were quite incidentally, I interviewed East Asians, South Asians, Southeast Asians, and Indians, Indian from the Indian subcontinent. Many of them all described this phenomenon. I interviewed 103 people. Um, they mentioned this Asian American playbook narrative. And I think this narrative is really important because it's something that all of us shared in common. So it's this informal, practical how-to guidebook for Asian Americans designed to show how to make it in this world, basically to be successful both at school and work. 
And so all of these kids, including, I guess me too, and majority, I think I would say 99% of the people I interviewed, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what end generation, talked about what their parents told them they ought to do. So this guidebook basically says, you know, you work hard and then you have access to opportunity. You're able to be in control of the situation, choose what you want to do with your lives and then find rewards for yourself. So of course, all of this dovetails with what all most achievement-minded Asian Americans or achievement-minded immigrants may feel. And it also dovetails with what mainstream American public accepts as a generic story for Asian Americans. Yeah. So this playbook, right, is really important, but however, it's also at the same time limiting. It helps guide you to a certain extent, but then it's very limiting when you get to the workplace because there are a lot of things it doesn't talk about. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's very interesting because some of the things you mentioned, you know, the lack of mentors, right? Uh, a bias for whites, uh, you know, the model minority, uh, you know, image, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of the, those things. But I also thought it very interesting, you know, you mentioned the word playbook, which I thought was very interesting. And I thought it was very interesting. We said at times the problem was, uh, the children were given the wrong playbook. You know, they were told to try, they were trying to succeed, but a playbook that was designed not to become a senior executive at a company, but just to be a great scientist or a great doctor or whatever it is. So do you think, do you, you, you know, you mentioned that, do you think that's a significant part? And do you think it's changed generationally, you know, uh, uh, over time? Well, so, so some of the things that it doesn't mention, and I'll go back to your question, is that, you know, it doesn't tell people about a structure of a corporation, it doesn't tell people about, you know, leadership skills, what kinds of skills are necessary, it doesn't talk about stretch assignments in the workplace, or networks of mentors, right? And it doesn't talk about how you could be authentically Asian American, because while we are all different, the world lots of times still see us as a certain type of Asian American, it doesn't talk to us about you know, not being perfect and learning from not being perfect. So it only gives you a contour, right? So your second question was, what is this playbook? Is it the wrong playbook? Well, it fits for a certain um, group of people, um, but I think we have to move away from this playbook. So I do think it's the wrong playbook. It gives you a contour, an outline, and it gives you an outline, especially for um, working class parents, Asian American parents who can't really or don't have any access to any mentors or don't know where to send their kids. So it gives them kind of an outline to share with a group of kids who may have access, very little access. But then that kind of image that it builds or the kind of Asian American student that it builds isn't enough. So we think that test scores are all you need, but it's not all you need. You actually need more than that. And I think later on in the book, I talk about how so many, there are so many competent people in there, you know, that you actually need to show other uh, qualities to move up other than just competent people. But one other point is that because so many of us follow this and so many people outside of being Asian American believe in this and reinforce this, it's actually something structural like, you know, certain testing systems or certain things that where Asian Americans are seen good at and that's where they're, they're pulled into and being that top scientist. You know, they're actually channeled or funneled into certain um, uh, workplaces because people believe that that's where they're good at. So me as a sociologist, there aren't actually that many of us out there who are Asian American sociologists. Let me ask you one question. Um... You know, you raised this issue about the playbook, right? And how for certain generations, and maybe not today, the, the parents would say, I want you to study hard, you know, uh, and be a doctor or be an engineer or so forth, right? But skill-based things where, you know, you supposedly, you, you know, you, 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 there's less discrimination, et cetera. Do you... When you, you know, I don't really answer this question, but if you look, do you know whether the data shows that Asian Americans have done better than than expected, at, you know, in terms of their 
number of doctors or number of engineers and scientists and so forth, professors, or is it or, or is it not clear? It's not clear because at entry level, you'll see this. So I just, I did a talk not too long ago um, for doctors and what it came up was that doctors, there are lots of Asian American doctors, lots of Asian American nurses, but what we don't see are people who are chairs of their apartments, heads of their um, certain respective uh, training universities, you know, so there aren't as many as you would think, given the number of Asian American doctors there are in the United States right now. And likewise, um, the lawyers, the numbers are actually, I think um, Judge Goodwin Liu did a study where Asian Americans become, uh, they have the highest um, numbers becoming lawyers, but actually the lowest ratio in becoming partners in many, many um, uh, firms. So it, so it's not clear. So you see people becoming these. The people, of course, when you uh, start in these professions, you know, you do well, you make a lot of money, you know, you, you show up in the statistics looking really good. But in the end, when you compare doctors to doctors and what they're actually doing or lawyers to lawyers, or maybe even engineers, and I can tell you academics, you know, um, in New York City, we now have our first two CUNY Asian American um, presidents of two colleges. Absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, One but, of whom is uh, Frank Wu, you know, who is uh, a committee 100 member, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that only happened two, three years ago, I think in the 2020s too, you know, during COVID, he became president. And I think there's David Wu. But before that, there was never an Asian American. And yeah. now when you look at the deans, hardly any, and hardly any chairs too. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that. Frank Wu says, don't, he, David Wu is a Wu, but we're not brothers. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. They're not brothers. Now, They're not brothers. I'm going to throw out a, uh, maybe a, a kind of a, 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 a contrarian or explanation, right? So you point out that, okay, a lot of Asians become doctors and engineers and so forth. They just don't become heads of their department or whatever. But when you talk about what parents of that generation were saying, they never were, they weren't saying, uh, I want you to be the head of oncology and so forth. They would say, I want you to be a doctor. I want you to be an engineer. So there are two ways of looking. You could either say, well, it didn't work because they didn't rise to the top. Or you could say, actually, it worked because they didn't tell their kids, I want you to be head of oncology or the partner of a law firm. They said, oh, I mean, I want you to be, you know, a scientist. So in a way, there's another explanation. Maybe they were successful, right? That they got the, 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 the but it's just that the, the goalpost they set was a different goalpost than being you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the head of a department. I mean, is there any logic to that? Yeah, I think it's perfectly logical what you're saying, right? But except that when I interview the people who are actually in those positions, many of them say that they actually wanted to move up to go mm -hmm. higher. It's what? not like, yeah. So they would say that, you know, there's certain things holding them back. A lot of times what I found was that many times thought, many times people thought it was they themselves. There was something... Uh, going on that they didn't learn about in terms of leadership um, that they needed to work on. So th that's there. But then other times what they would say, it's very similar. So like the people at the top of in, in, in my uh, book, the people within one or two positions of the leadership in, I, I only did, um, I didn't interview doctors. I didn't interview um, lawyers. They're mostly um, uh, media people, there were in corporations, finance people. So these people, um, when they talked about moving to the very top, they talked about trust. And in that trust is this leadership idea too. So when it's trust, the person needs to know how to use a key to keep the organization safe. So executives who got there said that they were trusted. Many people said that when they were at that high level, there are plenty of competent people to choose from. Remember, we talked about all these young Asian American women who their parents encouraged to be, you know, extremely capable with skills. They got their jobs, but there are fewer whom executives would trust. So Amy Cuddy, um, the research that I looked at, who worked with Susan Fiss, they looked at the stereo content model and they looked at these two axes, warmth and um, trustworthiness. 
So when a person first meets another person to establish a business relationship, trustworthiness actually matters much more than skills and competence. So if you're working with somebody or you're trying to work with somebody and that person doesn't trust you, you can't get far. But if you are trusted, your skills and intelligence becomes less of a threat and actually an asset in the relationship. So we notice a person's competence only after we judge their trustworthiness. So when it comes to hiring and promoting people, corporate executives have plenty of people, just like all the other leaders do, to choose from. So they wanna choose only those who are trustworthy. And if a person is trustworthy and a friend and competent, then that person will be really useful. If a person is not trustworthy and a foe, but also competent, that person can be really dangerous. So why I thought this is really important was that Asian Americans are seen as really competent, but at the same time, many of many times, and including now, we're always, we're kind of seen sometimes as a threat to people. Yeah. Right. Uh, right? So I think that's where people mention that somehow you have to overcome this. But this is more than just one person saying this as an individual. I heard this from I only interviewed seven, I have to say, who was at this top level. Seven people mentioned incidences where they thought it was really important to be seen as, you know, part of the gang at the top, part of the people who fit in, part of the people who shared a lot of similar interests with the people at the top so that they could be trustworthy. Yeah. So those are some of the things that I think would help you move to the top. You know, I'm a, I'm a strong believer that although there are certain injustices in society that are structural or otherwise, but it's also very important to ask yourself, are some of the problems created by your, by us? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because it's so easy to say, oh, it's other people and their practices and discrimination, right, that, that, uh, that create the problem. But I think it's important to say, are there some things that we are doing or that in fact contribute to the problem? And let me make a little, and why don't we mention, which is parents who say, oh, become a scientist, study hard, whatever it is. You know, if they had, more of them had said, I would love it if you became the CEO of a company or, or so forth, that might have, you know, had some impact. But let me throw out a couple things that could be in that category, which is, you know, that maybe our approach inhibits. So one is, it's very true that Asian Americans in general don't work together the same way that Jewish Amer Jewish American and others so forth. And in this society, a lot of success is you're being part of a group that together work on trying to get ahead and so forth. So that's one. The second one is a lot of people say, well, there, there are no Asian American mentors, right? Because it's self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if they, there's not there's no Asian American above you, how are you going to mentor? But if you talk to some of the people like Indian Americans or Japanese, they say a mentor is a mentor regardless of race. And in fact, if you talk to some of the most successful CEOs, they say, I had a mentor, but it wasn't somebody of their ethnicity that was their mentor. So those are two examples of things that maybe we contribute to the problem by the way they have. Any reaction to those two? examples? I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that sometimes many of us have this idea that we're competing with the other Asian American um, next to us. Mm -hmm. And I think that idea of the zero sum game actually promotes some of the things that you're talking about. It actually <laughs> discourages us from working together. And it actually um, prevents us from actually mentoring other people. Now, there's no reason why we can't have a mentor. I believe that we well, there are very few people like me. So almost all, in fact, all my mentors have been non-Asian American, except yeah. for maybe one lately, right? So they they don't really, there aren't, so there aren't a whole lot of us out there. But you, but I try to be a mentor to other people now because I realize that it's important. And I try to mentor other people who are um, black or Latino and Asian American, because I notice around me, there's so few. In my department, I only have one other African American scholar, mm -hmm. you know, a department of 16 people. You know, so I try to mentor as many people as I possibly can. So mm -hmm. I think that part of it is that, um, and I think you're right, it's this idea that we're competing with each other. 
And that's a very bad, bad mentality. And I also think that we also have to reach out to other people too, to, to show that we can do these very same things and also mentor and be allies with um, other black or Latino folks saying that, hey, you know, when we actually look at the bigger numbers, sometimes African-Americans do get promoted higher at a higher rate, but still the numbers are actually tiny, you know? And Asian American numbers are just a tad bigger than that at the very top. Yeah. So those are the things that we have to look at. If you look at asset management, I think it's something like, you know, almost 90% of trillions of dollars is managed by um, white males. So yeah. it's not white women. So, I mean, those are the things that we, we have to look at. And when you look at numbers in that huge, that broad stroke, you actually see that there are lots of people you could actually work with and I would encourage us to work with each other yeah, and we shouldn't see each other as I, I think lots of times we do see each other um, sometimes as competing against each other I, I try myself I do a lot of mentoring of people and it's very rewarding yeah do that uh, but you but with without any particular sense that I'm getting something selfish back at all right other than helping you know, feeling good to help uh, someone. Do you, you know, one of the issues I think, and it's my theory, is that in fact, that we're such a small minority. Actually, I'll tell you, I remember when I was growing up, I was talking to someone who had looked at the statistics, said the problem for Chinese Americans, he happened to tell me, is there are not enough of you to qualify to be a minority. In other words, if there's a minimum <laughs> percentage that if you're not above that, you're not a minority. I said, how could that be? You know, I mean, there's so few. It's just, oh, the, they don't want to have everyone, you know, classifying themselves a minority, you know, because there happen to be three of them or whatever. So we have that problem for a long period of time, you know, relative to other ethnic groups, which is it just weren't that many. And then we're diverse. So do you think that's also contributed because, you know, because there's diversity within, you know, within, uh, uh, you know, within Asian Americans? Yeah, I, I think I think all of that's true. I think our main um, problem is that we're invisible and, you know, and that people only, they don't know us well enough. They only see us as a stereotype. In fact, I forget what survey, I think it might've been Taft survey. They surveyed pe people and they asked them, well, who who's an Asian American you recognize? And they all mentioned Bruce Lee. I mean, Bruce Lee hasn't been around for a long time. And that was the 1970s, but people don't know another Asian American. So no. we're invisible, like you said, but the thing is our numbers are growing and we wouldn't be invisible if they actually counted us um, in the census, counted at us, or even newspapers wrote about not just black and white, but also included Asian Americans. And if they can't include Asian Americans, explain why. Are our numbers so low? But in New York City, if they're writing about black and white, they have to, they should, they ought to include Asian Americans in that story. And by writing about Asian Americans, by including Asian Americans, you actually learn about all the different kinds of Asian Americans. The Asian Americans with tons of leadership skills, the Asian Americans who are also quiet, who are also great in engineer that everybody thinks we are, but there's all kinds who are good in politics, who are good in the arts, who are good in, you name it. And that's the authentic self, I think. That's really important that people should see. I mean, like, I'm so happy that the movies have some Asian Americans in them now, but it's still not enough. And the ones that um, seem to do well, you know, have the big name stars, but very few um, do as well as some of those other movies. And those are the stories that are really important. And the reasons we are very diverse, you, you said, so I, I think it makes it hard for people to count all the different groups. It makes it hard. But the thing is, thinking that we're a diverse group should actually help us. You yeah. know, we're not all the model minority. By the way, although we have a long way to go in terms of Asian Americans uh, being in TV and, and films, I think we make some progress. Um, I was actually very pleased to see Asian Americans being cast as uh, in, 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 uh, in roles that were not Asian, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a show called Quantum and it's not an Asian thing, but the, the, the actor is Asian. 
So that's a breakthrough because for a long time, at best, you know, Asians played Asians, right? Or we had whites playing Asians, which, you know, created a lot of issues, you know, as well. Now, I have a small bone to pick with you, all right? Uh -huh. And that you, you know, you did talk about how, you know, uh, Asian Americans, you know, get into the elite schools and so forth. And that is a, is a big determinant of success. But yeah, they're not, yet they're not getting the same representation at the top levels and the CEOs of, say, Fortune 500 or whatever. Uh, the bone I picked you is I actually looked up the data. And I looked at the data to see how, from what schools do the CEOs of the Fortune 500 go to? And there are two things you'll notice. One is a little bit of support of you, which is there's a significant portion that went to, uh, you know, went to I Ivy League schools. And you'll be happy to know that the highest number is your alma mater, Harvard. You know, there were 28, 28 CEOs of the Fortune 500. But once you get past, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, certain schools, the number comes down and you're as likely to have someone who went to Iowa State or Babson or so forth. And that makes some sense because, you know, the the things that come with maybe someone getting to elite school are only a portion of the kind of skills that one should have uh, in order to end up being at the top. So I, I kind of pick up with you because you were talking about the elite school, well, if the elite school and so forth, but I'm not sure the message is that, you know, that that if you went to Babson, that you're, you're not going to be able to be CEO of Fortune 500 company. I mean, do you agree or disagree with me? I agree with you. <laughs> I have to agree with you. I did this because um, it was where my networks were. And so I have to say a lot of my friends went to elite schools and that's where I started my research. So I, had, I interviewed over 100 people. And so when I started interviewing them, I talked to my friends who were, you know, graduates of Harvard. And then through them, I asked them to introduce me to other friends. And so that's where it got broader. But I have to say, I didn't have anybody who went to Babson, you know? And so when I got to a certain number, I said, I have to stop interviewing, I have to start writing. Or my editor was saying, Margaret, you gotta stop, you gotta start writing. You know, I need the, I need the manuscript now. So yeah. I, I basically had to do that. But I think if I um, went back again, I would interview a broader group because the majority of Asian Americans um, who go to colleges don't go to these Ivy League schools. And, you know, and we know that some of our statistics or we know our statistics tell us that there's a good number of them who are doing really well. So yes, yeah. I would go back and actually, somebody else should actually do that study, yeah. you know, that time to, time to, you know, interview all these other folks um, who, who, you know, who, who are doing great. Yeah, if, if you were looking for the next research project, what I would suggest is to interview people who are Asian American who become CEOs of companies, but not just corporate, in traditional corporate, but also entrepreneurial and so forth, and then see what you learn, but also, again, take the approach you took uh, in your other interview, which is to make sure you group them by generation, because what someone might have faced if they're 65 and CEO would be different if someone who is 50 and CEO, right? And there'll be differences if it's a large company versus say on the other extreme, a startup that they, you know, you know, I mean, I guess if you want to guarantee to be a CEO, you just start a company and that, and no one's going to discriminate against you and hope to be success. But that's actually something that might be interesting to do because then you sort of say, okay, it's going the other way, which is what happened in your life and what did you do that caused you to break through these barriers, right? It'd yeah. be it'd be looking at the telescope from the, you know, the 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 other the other side, right? Yeah, I think that that's also, I don't know if you had a panel on that. That would be really great too. Because yeah. I think for the different generations, there are different reasons why they may become, you know, a startup head or different reasons why they might have left if they were in corporate America. You yeah. Know? So that's really interesting. I think it'd be great. Yeah. So um, 
let's see. The other thing is, and you mentioned about this, you know, being viewed differently, model minority, whatever. But obviously, the one thing that clearly is having some effect, and I'd be interested in your view, is this, you know, hate Asia, you know, phenomenon, whatever. And, and, you know, this is, there are a lot of reasons why it's happening, right? Certainly, the tension between China and the U.S. is is a contributor to that, and and so forth. But what what in your view, what effect has this more recent phenomenon having on this issue of the you know the ability of Asian Americans to succeed in corporate America? Do you think it's having any influence? And the other is, how do we how, how do we get out of this right? You know, out of this problem. It's 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 a big big problem. That's just. I think, you know, just making the situation worse. Yeah, so in, in the U.S., right, there's always two, but people don't think about it, but there's always two stereotypes that follow us. The model minority always being successful, which hides, you know, our, our inability to move up to the top, right? Um, because people just assume we're already there. And then, of course, it's this other one that you talk about, the perpetual foreigner or the forever foreigner. And when people think of us as not really being American, which is what, you know, the, the whole idea of like, um, you know, we, we're, we're Chinese or we're Asia and we're having, con the US is having uh, geopolitical conflicts with countries in Asia. Therefore, there are competitors and we shouldn't let them uh, steal our secrets or um, even move up because we really don't trust them. So that's a huge, um, um, I guess, problem that affects us in our work world and also in our daily lives, like anti-Asian violence. Daily lives, people may um, make fun of us again or make fun of our kids. Uh, I've heard reports of that increasing, even in New York City, uh, where people feel that um, they're not treated fairly enough and people think of them as uh, foreigners or people making those um, ching chong kind of language things to their kids, things that we may have faced as graduates in the 1980s or 1970s. It's coming back around again because of this um, tension and because of COVID. Now, how do we, so it causes, it's causing a problem actually for people up and down the age range um, that people haven't, people may not know about it, but I think for people in corporate America to deal with is that we have to show people in many, many ways that we are also American. Mm -hmm. And how do we show people that we're American? In many ways, it's by showing people that we work with allies. We work with people. Um, we're trying to fight for our voting rights. We don't want people to say that um, we can't buy land in certain states. We uh, actually have to take Right. right. We actually have to take a political stand, like you say, like what your next, your whole next panel is about. So many times it means actually expressing what we think. And that is part of what U.S. democracy is all about, that many of us, some of us may be fearful of, but most of us actually need to take a stand on. And I think that would actually help. And I think that what else is driving this is that it affects um that image affects all the people around us, not just white folks, black folks, Latino folks, you know, and even Asian Americans who may think that we are not American enough. So the whole idea is to um, show in the corporate world, even in your, um, keep those ERGs, those employee resource groups, keep those um, DEI initiatives, even though people are fearful of losing them, you need to keep them. To able to show that we are as a we are a group and we are important as a group, and we are actually as American as everybody else. And as I mentioned, half of us are actually American born and American raised. We're in yeah. the workforce. Yeah, no, that's right. Well, I think it's going to be a challenge, you know. And I think, you know, if I thought that the tensions with China were just temporary or whatever, maybe I worry a little less. And the reality is. The history of discrimination against Chinese is a very, very long, you know, the Exclusion Act and so forth. I mean, you know, uh, you know, when my father immigrated to this country uh, and we lived in 
Virginia, it was illegal for a white to marry an, a, a, an Asian. It was, yeah. you know, illegal. I mean, it's just a frightening. And it's, you know, you really, really, really worry about whether things are going to turn back to some of those things as, you know, and, and this land purchase thing is just another, an example of things that could could go back to the way it was, which is was bad. It's terrible. And, you know, I think what what's also going on is that um, it's really important to learn our history because you talk about our history with the Chinese Exclusion Act and with the intermarriage, misogyny, anti-miscegenation laws, you know? Um, so Loving versus Virginia. Anyway, so those are really important. So we, we need to put it in the context, right? So after the Civil War, there was the Reconstruction where African-Americans actually became, they had the highest number of uh, congressmen and senators ever. And then right after that was, um, um, they actually ended Reconstruction shortly after. So it was 1864, 68, and then all of a sudden, um, six years after the end of Reconstruction, it was the Chinese exclusion laws. So we can't look at that without seeing a connection. And yeah, I think many people, yeah, many people don't realize that. And I think that if we get out there to vote, if we actually say, look, our history, and it's coming back again, and it's actually coming back to haunt the other groups too, um, you know, is really important. So I know in a lot of DEI groups, um, they talk about anti-bias, but I think maybe what's more important is that all the groups should share histories, share yeah. basic histories. And if you learn about our histories, we'll try not to repeat it. But the problem is not a whole lot of people know our shared history in the US. And it's not something bad. I mean, like it's a sad chapter, a lot of these things, but we should know it. I mean, like I went to Munich, I could, you know, I went to see Dachau and that was a great way they presented it, what happened there. We yeah. need to be able to address it the same way or a similar way like yeah. that, our history in the US. Yeah, and I and I, you make a good point, which is I do think that uh, one of the things which is a problem is that other ethnic groups don't necessarily realize how badly Asian Americans were treated for a long time. And I won't repeat, you know, certain phrases, but you know, there's some people, other ethnic groups, said, "Well, you don't know how bad, you know, it was for us, you know, compared to, you know, your, you know, Asian Americans." But it, it, they just, they're never educated. They were never educated, you know, about the history of discrimination, uh, you know, and, and as a result, they have this false impression that things have been not so bad for Asian Americans relative to, you know, other, other, other Asian American groups. Uh, oh, by the way, you talked about voting. And so therefore, please, all of you, September 20th, you know, voting and representation, I want you to, to, cause Margaret said it's important. So you should, you should uh, attend. One of the things, you know, you focused on rising through the ranks in corporate and you were very specific. You said, I'm not going to try to focus on academia or or on, you know, other professions. Uh, but closely related to the success on the corporate ladder is board representation. Could you comment a little bit about what you think, how bad the problem is and why you think it's, it, it's not exactly the same dynamic? It may have some overlapping dynamic. Yeah, so boards are really interesting. I, I, I was gonna look up the, the current numbers, but I think the numbers for all of the different um, people of color groups are still relatively low. Although I think Asian Americans are getting higher up there. Women are generally low, but board dynamics are different because you need to be on, usually on another board to be nominated onto a board. Right. You usually have need contacts to be able to draw you in. So it's not the same as being promoted in the workplace, but you need to have specific kinds of, I would call them assets, but not the same way as just money, but you need certain aspects, certain kinds of qualities uh, to be able to do that. So I think for a lot of Asian Americans, because they haven't risen up in a corporation to the C levels, it makes it even difficult, more difficult to get on these boards too. So they're connected and not connected at the same time. Yeah. One other pet pet theory that I have is the uh not the misdirection, but the false, the the you know, the the promotion that creates a dead end. And yeah. one theory I have is 
you know, when there was a lot of activity in Asia for Japan, China, so forth, one of the favorite things was to have someone head of Asia who was Asian, right? So forth. And yet I do think that actually became a trap because then you were seen as you were a special purpose executive, you know, and that you were make, given that position because you were Asian and it's an, you know, the Asian thing. But then I, I know a lot of people who found it very hard to come back, you know, get promoted up to the corporate level, you know, above the, you know, head of Asia or something like that. Do you think that's true? And 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 any advice to people who, you know, should you sort of say, no, I don't want to be, uh, you know, become head of the Asia thing because uh, you might get trapped there? Yeah, so I interviewed somebody who was exactly in that position and she came back and she couldn't really move up anywhere um, in the US. So I think person who's offered that position have to needs to think about it carefully. And I think if you can negotiate a way like a limited time and to come back in a certain position here back in the US, then I think that might be the way to do it. So that way it's a stint. It's just a stint on your leg and your journey up the corporate ladder. I'm gonna learn about Asia so that I can know more about all the different aspects of the company. But you have to know that going in. And not a whole lot of people know that, that they're actually, um, like you said, it's a trap. They're cornering you into a certain position where they believe that that's the only place you could be. There's no and, other place be. And you get, you get stereotyped from a you know, managerial point of view, right? Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that we got a large group of people who are listening and so forth, and I want to tell you, Margaret, you're one of the few where the number of people has been going up since we started. So usually, you know, you, you lose people, but they, it's been going up. I've been watching. Uh, for all the people in the audience, maybe if you said, what are the five or six things that you would advise them in terms of to the extent that they're trying to make their way to the top in the corporate world, right? Because that's where you've been focused. Sure. So I usually give advice on both. You could There's things that you can improve yourself. And there are things I think that you could advocate for the corporation or your organization to try to help to improve for you and for all the people coming up or and even the people above you. So there's always two ways of looking at this and doing it. So all of us know that, you know, we're not perfect, right? There's skills that we could learn. Go out and do better than that. You know, if you need help in speaking skills, go take a presentation workshop. If you think that your storytelling needs help, go take a writing or narrative class and learn how to tell better stories so that you can, you know, do those presentations. That's always helpful and that's always fun. Um, and you get to meet lots of people, right? Even if you need Excel skills, do it, learn it. If that is what you think you need, you need to be able to hold that data in your mind and to be able to share it and to massage it in a way to explain it to people, do that. Now for the corporate side, I would say encourage them to have these pipeline programs that help not only you, but the people around you. Because what happens is that when you get up to a certain level, it's not just you you should be thinking about, it's you and the people next to you. So you need to move up together. The other thing I would encourage, and a lot of corporations actually like this, but not I haven't heard lately, but to have pipeline programs in a certain industry. So that when people, because generally the youngest people who are hired are the first fired and they tend to be people of color. If you have a pipeline program for a certain industry, then other, another corporation can pick them up and hire them. That will increase more numbers of people of color, including Asian Americans, right? I would advocate for that. I would advocate, as we were talking about, Asian American studies or black studies different kinds of histories that people need to learn and encourage everybody to go to them, not just the people of color, but the whole corporation should focus on that. And I know people, a lot of people are tired of anti-bias training, tired of, of hearing about it, tired of seeing that, oh, why are you calling me racist? But here's a way to actually discuss something else. Is this our history? To learn about it, you know? If everybody got to that, got that far, most likely all of them at least have a college degree. Everybody will just, you know, go back and crack open a book, have an assigned reading. It's not that difficult to do that. Yeah, that's right. You know, you mentioned pipeline and corporate programs for diversity and so forth. So that reminds me of really the following observation. We all know that the recent Supreme Court 
ruling against affirmative action was a major, uh, you, you know, uh, development. And there, and there are people on both sides with regard to whether they think that it's going to help or hurt, you know, the cause of Asian Americans. But the other thing that's happened, I noticed recently, is now you have activists who are now going after companies saying their diversity programs are discriminatory and it should be stopped. Any comments about that? And because that that's, you know, that's directly into the corporate, you know, environment, which, you know, you've been looking at. Yeah, so the the court rulings actually don't say anything about corporations. Right. Those groups should not be uh, calling or suing firms or suing venture funds, stopping them from giving out $20,000 when venture fund capital, when billions actually go out to, when you look at the racial numbers, go out to white folks, right? And that they're actually 0.0% who get those funds for a black and Latino. And Asian Americans are only just a little bit higher. So the, that is truly injustice. And lawyers actually have to be looking and using those numbers to sue the other way around. It's not just about the racial category, but it's actually about how much money is being given out in ratio to who actually has it out there. So as a sociologist, I would say, you can't lose those metrics. You can, they're gonna sue you in all kinds of things, but you cannot have EEO, you cannot have your company stop counting the number of people in these different categories or in the different ethnic categories for Asian Americans in addition. So that's very important because if you lose those categories, how are you going to know how few of us have moved up? Part of the reason why I was able to do this study was that I knew the full numbers and people actually knew those numbers. And it wasn't about, and they even, individuals didn't even say, I was discriminated against. They talked about what was going on in the company overall. And mm -hmm. so we got that sense. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm, I'm gonna encourage people, we, uh, we have a few minutes. So if there's anyone who has a question, please uh, either raise your hand or type, type, type in your question into the chat box and, let, and hopefully we can see it. We have, okay. Christine, you raised your hand. Please say your question and the next one will be uh, Mary Del Chu. So go ahead, Christine. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you so much for an informative um, webinar. I think that the chat has been disabled, so that's why I raised my hand. But it will it be okay if, um, like, uh, for us to connect with you and, um, like, you know, are you comfortable, uh, Peter and Margaret, to share your maybe some some email of your office? We would love to be in touch with you. Um, and also, maybe we could also invite you for some other um, event. I think that is so, so helpful. And the content that you provided is, is so useful. A lot of us, even you know, Asian, are not aware of what you are saying. And you are saying such in a clear way. So like, you know, we would like to invite you again. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, my um, my information is on the Hunter College website. Okay. So you can always find me there. I, I have to say that I am uh, kind of, um, I'm learning how to be chair, which is really difficult. Um, so, um, but you know, you, you can let me know, let me know what you're doing and um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. By the way, my father was chair, was a professor and chair of his department, and he 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 would agree with you. It's not so easy. Uh, Mary Del Chu, you you uh, you know, please unmute yourself. You you raised your hand quite a while ago. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, I I live in San Diego, and um um. I was I was accepted to UC Berkeley, but I had an illness, so I couldn't go. So I went to UCSD. Um, but I've experienced um, a lot of prejudice my whole life, and even I'm still experiencing that right now. And um, I I reach out to people, but 
they're not after a few questions they find out i'm from here and not from china and then they lose interest so is there a so yes i could I, I mean a lot of people as i mentioned before they have this perpetual foreigner idea that we're always all of us are um, not from here and that has to do with the way the census uh, portrays us as i mentioned the 1.5 generation you know they're they're not, they might have come here when they're age three but they're thoroughly american but the census still counts them as foreign born so the in the census the majority of us are still foreign born but when you meet us and talk to us we're all pretty much american and we have to exercise our american right, rights to vote and to speak out i think that's really important uh, we're not that small of a group anymore especially in the large cities so yeah. thank you we too hi what? can you we hello can... oh Oh, okay. great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all the information. Very informative and a lot of everything you both have said I could completely relate to. What I do have a very similar challenge in that climbing up the ladder, I'm continuing to uh, secure a, low, a spot that I'm quite comfortable and hit that ceiling. What I tend to, under, my understanding, at least my observation where the, the buck has stopped, it was possibly because of management style, um, where as an Asian American, when you're raised with a certain, uh, I would say attributes and the style of, com of communication, could that be potential one of the factors that could be hindering that, that climb or the, you know, ascending to above? Yeah, of course. So I think even more so you're female. So lots of times, when you look at gender, we're not we're we're women and we're also Asian American. And so sometimes it's not ourselves, but because we may be a little bit quiet, but people assume that being quiet means that you're also not a good leader, right? So it's not something you did wrong, but it's also because it comes from a place where you're a female, you're seen as quiet, you're Asian American, you're seen as quiet, and they just don't see that you could be a possible leader. So it could be the opposite too. So if you're assertive and you're a female and you're an Asian American, you're opposite the stereotype what people think you are, it actually hurts you in many, many ways. So, but for a female, and a lot of studies have been done that Asian American females are actually have the most difficult time moving up. And this is when they compare to black women, Latino women and Asian American men, because all of the stereotypes about us are actually not seen as any kind of leadership stereotypes or leadership um, qualities is what they are. Yeah. Peter? Fun. Yeah, can we have um, a last question? I have to run off. Uh, and so this, so hold on one second, hold on. I'm going to, I'm having some trouble with the controls here. Okay. All right. L last last question. So um, I think uh, I think I was asked to speak, um, and I'm I'm asking about two two kind of related questions about groups within the Asian American population. The first is um, I've worked in this space myself from the corporate side for a long time in various capacities, none of them official, um, and tried to understand why we are such a relatively large group of people yet uh, uh, not well represented in upper echelons of management. One of the things I found in my early years was I found a lot of American born um, Asians, mostly Chinese, we're very reluctant to self-identify and as um, being a part of a group that needed support and needed to support each other. Um, many of whom I spoke to actually said, oh, I don't have any problems. I don't see any problems. And I kept thinking, wait till you get to my age. You will see there will be a ceiling. And some are seeing that now, but it's kind of, you know, it's like, I wish we could have done something 20 years ago. 
Another, and, and so I guess I'm wondering if you saw any of that, because you have mentioned the Asian born Chinese and, or the American born Chinese, and I, I felt that they had actually self-selected not to belong. And kind of related to this, I find there's a lot of South Asians who I feel, but I have no statistics to go to re reference, who I feel have done quite well. And I'm wondering whether you see the same thing and why that might be if you do. I will just interrupt by saying, we had a couple of previous panels with researchers who did research exactly on this. You know, Mike, mm -hmm. Mike Morris of Columbia Business School and Jackson Liu of MIT Sloan School. And their data uh, would certainly suggest, suggest that Indian Americans do better than other uh, Asian Americans, and they have reasons why. Uh, and we th that's recorded. So if you're interested, just go to the Committee 100 website and listen to that recording. And uh, they'll explain at least why they think Indian okay. Americans do better than other Asian Americans. But go ahead, Margaret. Margaret. Yeah, Thank so you. uh, your first part about American born. So it kind of depends where you're growing up in like every Asian American. Um, is very different depending on the generations they come from and depending on which ethnic group they are. So Indians are very different, Chinese are very different. And so it could be that at the time you were talking to that the group and where they came from, Chinese were actually doing quite well moving up. So there's a time when people did get affirmative action in the workplace or were noticed in these pipeline programs or were recruited into certain areas where people felt that Asian Americans were needed. So that was definitely the case, you know, when I started in the corporate world, and I think short and right after too, and only a little bit later where I think these um, affirmative action programs were pulled out, and many Asian Americans were no longer included in them, right? So it kind of depends on the individual. Some Asian Americans also feel very uncomfortable identifying and saying that they are actually um, Asian American or want to be with other Asian American groups. Now we are all different, I have to say, and we have to respect our differences, but as a group, as a whole, people still outside of the group see us and many times treat us the same way. So overall, we see these lower numbers, but there's no, nothing to say that individuals haven't moved up. And we do have successes. It's not like we don't, we do, but we don't have large success is what I think um, Peter and I, uh, we talk about in this uh, seminar series. Yeah, so we like we need to end. I, I apologize. A couple of you had questions, but we've run out of time. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Chin for you know one. It was a wonderful book. I encourage all of you if you don't have a copy or you know to 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 purchase it. Some wonderful insights, and thank you so much for sharing uh, your uh, you know your perspectives with the audience um, and um, congratulations and condolences on being promoted, right? And uh, again, for all, the, I wanna thank all of you in the audience and thank you for participating. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings event. Thank you for having me. Take care, bye-bye.